Welcome everyone. We've shared the session resources a couple of times in the chat. So you'll see a link to the Padlet and a link to the Google folder resources. And we can go ahead and get started. We're going to be collaborating today around the effective instruction of SLIFE, students with limited or interrupted formal education. Um, and you can see a little bit of info about who's doing the presenting. And we will, as always, start off by expressing our gratitude to you that you're coming to us at the end of a probably pretty long day. And uh, we really appreciate you being here to collaborate with us. So I'm Diane Sterfenner. I'm the president of Support Ed, and I will be one of your co-facilitators today. Um, I'm a former ELD or ESOL teacher, dual language assessment specialist, and dual language teacher. And um, we in Support Ed, we're based in Fairfax, Virginia, outside, right outside of Washington, DC. I'm Shannon Smith. I'm one of the multilingual learner coaches with Support Ed. I'm a former English language development teacher, uh, instructional coach, and district administrator. Thanks, Shannon. Oops, clicked one too many times. So just you've been seeing some messages come through the chat. Our colleague Diane Choi is sharing those and her messages start and end with three asterisks. So you can tell them apart. A little bit more kind of housekeeping and virtual session norms. There are a few ways to participate with audio and video with the whole group, audio and video in breakout rooms. You can write in the chat. Um, if you're working independently, you can turn off your video if you would like and turn it on when you're ready to come back to the whole group. That's a great sign to us that you're ready to get started, or you can type in ready in the chat. So document one in your Google folder outlines our overview of RPD. So we had our first session last month. I can't believe we're already in October towards the end. We're in our second session today on effective instruction. And you can see we're on our second of four sessions and these are all being recorded as well. We wanted to start off by sharing some feedback with you from last time. If you were here last time, let us know in the chat so we know how many of you joined us last time. Just to kind of get a show of hands if you were here. Great. So some of our feedback, we've organized it into themes, glows and grows. So you can see some of the glows, time to discuss, the pacing, the number of resources and some areas of growth that you recommended were more strategies and tools. Not as much time on presenting, but using more time to discuss and look at some strategies and tools. So as a result of your feedback, what we're gonna do a little differently this time is we'll give you even more strategies and tools. We have a lot this time to share with you, so get ready. Um, you'll have more time to talk with your colleagues and explore some of these strategies and tools. And then you'll have more time to discuss these strategies and tools. So we have three objectives for today. You're going to explore a framework for effective instruction of SLIFE. You'll discuss strategies for supporting SLIFE engagement with and understanding of content learning. And then you'll set goals for supporting the academic needs of SLIFE in classrooms. We have a lot of icons to share with you again. So you can see all of these. You'll have items in the folder and the icons show up on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, under that materials on the Padlet, we'll have some video today. You'll have opportunities to discuss, to meet in breakout rooms, and I think we're doing a poll. We'll see if we're if that how that works out. So I also wanted to point you to the Padlet of resources, so you can scroll left to right and up and down. So our materials from last session are in the left hand column, 
and additional resources. And for today, we've got our slides in this column and other resources to support today's session and a link to the Google folder. So you have a couple of different ways to engage with the materials. So I wanted to share. Oh, Shannon, I can't control your slides anymore. There we go. Oh, now it's working. And I skipped ahead too far. So document two in your folder is an agenda for today. So I'd like you to just take a couple of minutes and review the agenda and identify what you're looking forward to. And you can write that in the chat. So we want to set an intention for today's session. So in the chat, share, what are you looking forward to? Strategies, thanks. Great. Programming at elementary level, strategies, setting goals. Thank you. Okay. You can keep them coming as I turn it over to Shannon. Hi, everyone. So when we're looking at meeting the needs of our slave learners, uh, we can use this model that was adapted from the New York City Department of Education. Uh, and when we think about in September session, we really focus on that social emotional learning and um, meeting the culturally responsive needs of our students through strategies and tools. In this session, we're focused on that academic supports and strategies, which includes the use of home language. And I saw that many of you were with us last time, so we talked a little bit about who our students with limited or interrupted formal education are. And so just briefly, uh, a common definition for, for SLIFE are those multilingual learners who have a, a language other than English spoken in the home. They enter the US after grade two and have at least two years less schooling. Um, they're also at least two years below grade level and have gaps in their education. So what are your experiences with SLIFE? Um, in the chat, share some specific strengths that they bring. Good at communicating, that excitement to learn, diversity, grit and resilience, knowing multiple languages, so while they bring some strengths, what are some challenges that life might face? language barriers, they might have those gaps in education, the language, traditional academic skills. And sometimes you're right, knowing that they're, they're different or um, so, that kind of leads into what is the role of culture in education for life?
the role of culture. So what would be the role of culture in education for SLIFE? That explicit support with underlying elements, focusing on maybe collectivism versus that individualistic culture, celebrating cultures. And I know a lot of these were topics that we uh, really dove into a little deeper in September. So if you didn't have a chance to be with us in September, definitely check out the uh, recording that's posted on the main website. The mismatch between school's expectations and uh, for parents and the family's expectation for involvement, that's a, that's a huge one. Thank you, everyone. So it ties into what can we do about some of those pieces. Um, in the book, Meeting the Needs of uh, SLIFE, a Guide for Educators, um, there were several steps that educators can take to ensure cultural responsiveness in addressing the needs of SLIFE. Um, the first is building those relationships. When you establish a relationship with students that, and families that's supportive and genuine, um, and ongoing and is a two-way relationship, it can really help to support students in the classroom and also building the peer relationships within the classroom. Uh, like many of you noted, they, they, that collectivist culture can be celebrated and used to benefit students. Identifying uh, cultural priorities. Uh, as you all noted, the, it's, there's, sometimes that disconnect between what the priorities are of the school versus what the priorities are of students and families when it comes to education, knowing what the school priorities are and what the expectations of it in, um, for our SLIFE and their families can really help support students as they're interacting in their educational system. And finally, making connections, helping students making, make that connection between the familiar and the unfamiliar. Um, it's really important that we don't just assume what is familiar because SLIFE are coming from varying different uh, backgrounds. So getting to know them, it, again, it goes back to the relationships and the cultural priorities. They all work in connection with each other uh, so that we can make sure the schooling that we have, their education is um, interconnected and relevant to them. And that's where the mutually adaptive learning paradigm comes from, or MELT. The underlying premise of this framework is that mutual adaptation. Um, educators are adapting their pedagogy as SLIFE are adapting to formal education in the United States and new ways of learning and thinking. So that adaptation by both parties is necessary for SLIFE to succeed in U.S. schools. So we're going to take a closer look at the, the framework. There are three components. The first is to accept conditions for learning. When working with SLIFE, we want to begin with where they are now by accepting their conditions. Many SLIFE need content that's immediately relevant and interconnected in order to learn. So over time, we would move then into a combined process for learning so that they can be successful in U.S. schools. So that's when we start looking at the shared responsibility with introducing individual accountability. Um, just like many of our SLIFE come in with learning more from an oral history. So taking that oral to the written word uh, and getting students used to that transmitting information through print. And then the final component of new activities for learning. So that's when we begin to familiarize students with the language and content to develop the skills to complete the academic tasks to introduce that new way of thinking, because in American schools and formal education in America, a lot of tasks are decontextualized. So this way we're taking, moving students from what they're 
comfortable with into being more successful in American schools and American um, academics. So in the chat, what do you notice or what stands out to you from the MALP framework? And we recognize it's a lot to take in. <laughs> What's what immediately strikes you? Mm -hmm. Going from the familiar to the unfamiliar. The, the yeah, the oral memories. The need for immediate relevancy. And the shared responsibility. And it is. It's a lot. The framework is very dense. So as we go through the rest of the session today, we're going to be interweaving a lot of those concepts through as we share those strategies. So I think, Diane, I'm going to pass it on to you. All right. So we're going to now, now that you've had a moment to think about the framework, we'll dive a little deeper and pull out some strategies aligned to the framework. So we're gonna be looking at these, whoops, five components. So you can see them all here. School culture and routines, building conditions for learning, using those oral language activities and really leveraging our students' oral language skills, scaffolding, using familiar language and content, and then giving them intensive literacy and numeracy instructions for those students who would benefit from that. So let's take a look. So in the chat, can you share an aspect of school culture or school routines that our SLIFE might not be familiar with, especially if they haven't been in a US school before? So what's one example? What's the first thing you think of? Quietly walking in the halls. Yeah, what else? Taking turns. Worksheets. Raising hands, using the bathroom or a computer, full day instruction, lining up. Desks and lockers and so many norms in the cafeteria, right? Like, think about that. How many unwritten or unspoken norms are there? Thank you. You can keep adding to that list if you would like. Bus, oh my goodness, the bus norms. So yeah, there are so many um, school culture and routine considerations. Yeah, oh, I saw BRB, I'm like, what's BRB? Oh yeah, what norm is that? Yep, be right back. Okay, so, and think about these, you know, being taught with each student and not only at the beginning of the year, right? Because we have SLIFE students coming in at all different points of the year. So many of you mentioned these things, some others that I didn't see, PE expectations, changing your clothes, dressing out, emergency drills, report cards, um, different attendance procedures, using an agenda or a planner, for example, homework expectations. So you all named so many and they're just, the list goes on and on. So one thing we need to uh, police in the school. Yeah, absolutely, resource officers. So one strategy is that you can teach students some of the language they'll need to ask for support. So you can see some examples here. Um, let, you can share more examples in the chat. What are some things they need to ask for support on? So you can share those in the chat if you see what page are we on? Can I see an example? This is just for instruction, right? In addition to all of the other norms. So our um, second component of in effective instruction is to build the conditions for learning. So we mentioned the interconnectedness and the immediate re relevance. So to uh, get a sense of you know, the interconnectedness, we have to keep in mind that SLIFE, as we've shared before, probably may come from collectivist cultures. And so learning about students will make it easier to build on their backgrounds ex and experiences and understand their priorities for learning. So also having them share stories will help build a more shared and collective culture in the classroom that'll feel more familiar to them and it'll strengthen bonds among the students. 
and unpacking the immediate, immediate relevance a little bit more. So students who are relatively new to formal education need to feel that what they're learning is relevant to them personally. So some ways to do this are helping make helping them make connections to their lives. Um, I'll show some ex an example next of student friendly objectives that make sense to them that feel relevant to them. And using authentic real life examples and language will also help them build this immediate relevance. So one strategy is having student friendly objectives. So for a content objective, here's an example of a student friendly version and a language objective that supports the content objective. Another strategy, so we said we're gonna share a lot of strategies, right? This is your feedback. So I hope you're, uh, you know, you're ready for a lot of these. So, and these are all on the Padlet as well. You can access the PowerPoint and the Padlet to come back to these. Another strategy is um, having the teacher is learning about their students through music. So after they provide the students with directions, they um, scaffold each component with vocabulary explained and sentence starters as well. So you can take a look at what the assignment is and then what students, um, what kind of scaffolds they get. Another strategy is connecting to prior experiences and learning. So I'll give you some examples of what a couple of these look like, but you can see examples here. Do you have any others that you use to connect to your students' prior experiences and learning? You can share them in the chat if you do. There are many items on the list, personal stories, self-assessments, letting them use, um, encouraging them to use home language. But I'll share a couple of examples. So you can use, yeah, KWL chart. Great, thank you. Can use a gallery walk for students to make predictions. And it gives you a little bit of an informal formative assessment about their background knowledge. So when studying a unit, you could have them move around the room, look at images, and then make a prediction using um, some of the supports that we see. Living museums, great, thank you. Another activity to help them make connections and um, engage them in their learning, building the conditions for learning, is having them do an I see, I think, I wonder. And we're actually going to do this in breakout rooms. So you'll be using document three, and you'll have about eight minutes to discuss what you notice and wonder about this picture. So you'll use these sentence stems, I see, I think, and I wonder, to discuss. And then you'll talk about why this is beneficial, might be beneficial for life. So when you get into your breakout rooms, you'll introduce yourselves, you'll have a recorder and a reporter, and there's a space on your Google Slides for you to type that information in. And then you'll talk about what do you notice and wonder about this picture? and then talk about why this might be beneficial for life. So you can see at the bottom of the slide that there's space for you to write in your answer to that discussion. And then we'll have a debrief afterwards. So are there any questions? And the directions are in the chat, so you can come back to them. We encourage your recorder or reporter to share their screen when you go into breakout rooms. And we're gonna be popping into them. Shannon, Diane, Joy, and I will be popping in. So we can go ahead and send them, thanks. Report again. So I spent some time in groups one and two, and I asked group two to share why this activity might be beneficial for life. So Laura, do you wanna? Sure. Um, so we looked at the picture um, and the specifically why it might be beneficial to life would de depend on the reason that you're showing the picture in the first place, whatever the content lesson was that you were trying to discuss. 
um, there's a vocabulary piece, but then it's hard to know where you were going. Maybe you were going to talk about climate change. Maybe you're talking about accidents. Maybe you're talking about funny things that happen. I, it would depend on whatever the lesson was that you could use as a background and you could tap into whatever the students had done in the past. Great, thank you. Yeah, we didn't share what the purpose was for the activity, what was coming next, just to get your to get your thoughts on it. Is there another group who'd like to share? I can share from group one. Um, we thought that an activity like this allows for increased language use in each in each phase. So we started out with fairly simple words and phrases and it built up to um, more expanded sentences. It went from concrete to more abstract thinking. And of course it provided a visual and perhaps students could connect to something involved in this picture. Maybe they have experience with a flood or an accident and it allows for open-ended answers and it's a collaborative lesson. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, and I would also caution to really, of course you would know your students' backgrounds if you know that you have a life student who just is moving to the US because of a flood devastated their community. I would not use this particular image, right? So it, it comes back to knowing your students and their backgrounds. Thanks. Well, I think, is there anyone else who'd like to share any other groups, what you discussed? Um, for, uh, sorry, it's this missile time, my school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, um, so for our group four, we did uh, the visuals provide the student a chance to use oral language, may elicit oral language if they're able to describe things. Um, he activates prior knowledge, uh, you know, of flooding or rain or the setting, they may recognize the setting, um, use of descriptive language. Um, it provides them a chance for social communication because you, could be doing this in a small group or whole class activity or opportunity for writing as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's definitely a, a very social activity. It can be if it's structured and scaffolded to be that. Thank you. So we are going to, that was a great thing you mentioned, Karina, about the kind of the social aspect of this. Um, so we know that the value of oral language practice for SLIFE is, is really great. So we want our students to hear and practice this discipline specific language. They're repeating language and vocabulary. They're using it in different ways as you probably experienced doing this um, breakout group. It, helps them focus on, we know that oral language is a great springboard and support for literacy development. It's a way for them to recycle vocabulary and retain content. And it helps them with these kind of social aspects that, especially with the pandemic, our students have not had as many opportunities to build relationships with peers and increase their um, engagement and hopefully motivate them. So one act, another activity, so we're sharing a lot of strategies and activities today. One is called the 136 protocol, where students have an, they're asked a question or they develop an idea individually. Then they come together in groups of three to expand on their ideas. And then they come together in a group of six or approximately six students to then brainstorm all of their ideas and prioritize one or two one or two that are really helpful to them. So I was sharing this activity last week in um, the Southeast TESOL conference and participants, they walked through it and they said, I would do it the opposite way. I would do six, three, and one because our students are more collectivist. Maybe they'd like to start as a large group and then refine their ideas by removing people to end up at the individual idea. So I thought it was an interesting take on that as well. So I just thought I would pass that along. 
So another activity um, is for students to choose an example. So this is a speaking and listening activity that um, helps them have sustained reciprocal conversa conversation on content. So for example, after studying the US civil rights movement, um, they, students might be asked to select an image from that time period and explain orally why they chose the image that they did, what the image shows and what it doesn't show that they have learned about the civil rights movement. So there's also some scaffolding that goes along with that, some that explains each of the images and gives them um, some sentence frames and stems. And then in a small group, they would write down their group member's name, which image they chose, and what the image shows or does not show related to the civil rights movement. And this is all on the Padlet as well for you to use or adapt. Another activity is an information gap. So in the chat, let us know, have you done an information gap type of activity with students? Yep. Oh, and Robin says, what language proficiency level are you recommending these activities for? We really recommend them for any level so you can scaffold them up or down depending on your student's level of proficiency. You can also try these in the home language um, and maybe just make it more image rich. Um, great. So Rebecca said, yeah, it's just like Battleship. It's fun. So pairing students, each student is given different information and they have to fill in. You talk, talk to their partner to fill in information or complete a task. So this is an example here from Esther Park, um, who we've collaborated with in the past. Another strategy is using, providing students sentence stems and formulaic ex expressions to support them in different talk moves. So you can see examples here for restating, agreeing, adding to an idea, making it a connection. And these are very critical for SLIFE students to use, but um, your students in general, even native English speakers who might need a little extra support might benefit from these as well. And we'll give you a chance to take a look at a couple of more peer um, activities to support oral language. So documents 4A and 4B, we just saw the links come up in the chat. We'll give you about three minutes or so to open these up and take a look at them. And then you're going to, after that, go into breakout groups to talk a little bit more in depth about oral language activities. So take a look at these documents and then we'll come back. I don't know if I can, Shannon, if I can click on the timer or you have to do that maybe, okay. I think our timer stopped. We're frozen at 2.40. <laughs>
Okay, our time is up and we're going to go to breakout groups. Um, let me know, are you okay with the same group or would you like a different group? You can respond to me directly if you would like. I've seen a couple saying same group, so I think we'll go ahead and stick with the same one. So what we're going to do, you'll have eight minutes. You've already introduced yourselves. You don't need to do it again. You can have maybe a new reporter to share with the whole group and talk about one oral language activity you'd like to try in your classroom. Maybe something we've just shown you here, or maybe something else you might learn from a colleague and some steps you might take to ensure that SLIFE are prepared to participate. And so be ready with one statement to share that summarizes your discussion. So we'll give you about eight minutes and we'll send you back to the same groups. Okay, so I think we are coming back and I believe group three might wanna share. And you have these sentence starters if you would like to use them and incorporate them. If not, that's okay. I would love the sentence starters here. Hold on. <laughs> well, um, we talked about the fact that we like the um, group, the grouping where you went from the one, three, six, that mm -hmm. that was great because it got um, them thinking and then speaking um, with peers, which is always good to be using the language. And then we discuss the use of scaffolding um, by using pictures and anything that can help to um, understand the lesson. So any type of visuals, hands-on things, whatever we can put our hands on that can help them to understand. Great, thank you. Yeah, the, the visuals are definitely very supportive of that. Thanks. Any other groups? I'll go for our group. Um, we discussed the, it was the 136 and then also the choose an image. Mm -hmm. um, for example, for me, I don't have a whole classroom. The other person is, has a mainstream classroom, but has a couple of SLIFE students. So making groups sometimes is hard. Like, who do you pair that person with? In my case, I don't have enough students to make a six person group. Mm -hmm. um, but to support them, sentence stems, maybe some visuals would help. But our bottom line was sometimes putting these things into practice are harder than it seems. You know, the reality of that. Right. It can be hard, or you might encounter some challenges that you don't anticipate. You have to give up some control when you do, for sure. So, yeah, I would encourage you to, you know, to try, take one strategy you might want to try, try it out, pilot it, and refine it and come back to it. And also ask your students for their input. Like, very, very often we don't ask our students, hey, how did that go? What could I do to improve that? What, what would work for you? So it's a, a great way to bring in student voice as well. But thank you for sharing. So we are gonna take about a five minute break. So it's 4.03, come back at about 4.08, maybe 4.09 and we'll get started. So take a stretch break, 4.09, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to now uh, discuss the fourth element. Let me see. I think I've lost all of you for a moment. Stop sharing for a moment. There you are. So the fourth element is effectively scaffolding instruction for SLIFE. 
um, because we really want to know that scaffolding academic tasks is using that familiar language and content. And I know we have a question in the chat about those students that have those significant academic gaps, and we're going to talk about that in a few moments. Um, but with scaffolding, um, we scaffold serve as that temporary support as students gain the language and those academic skills so that they can be able to perform that task um, that they couldn't do without help. Um, so while they may be behind academically, providing some additional supports um, and guidance, we'll be able to uh, eventually uh, independently complete the task on their own. And we want to provide the appropriate scaffolds um, to students based on their proficiency level and experience. Um, another benefit for uh, SLIFE is to use consistent scaffolding across multiple uh, content areas. And um, one second. Um, so in terms of uh, when we think about what do we do for students that are behind multiple years, uh, especially acquiring language and skills quickly, um, we're going to have to simultaneously expose them to content, which is very hard, but at the same time, backfill some of those skills. Um, like Laura, you mentioned uh, having to teach decimals and fractions while students are still performing basic skills. So this is where some of the scaffolding might come into play of being able to uh, provide some of those skills and strategies um, while and break down some of those mathematical skills and give some tools while building and developing some of those other concepts, maybe at an additional time of the day. So in terms of uh, scaffolds, WIDA, based on the work of the WIDA consortium, we've uh, grouped scaffolds into three categories, uh, materials and resources, instruction or instructional practices, and then student groupings. Um, and again, it's important to note that depending on the task or the language proficiency, SLIFE may need more than one scaffold in each of the three categories and might need um, greater support um, and using the same one across a multiple um, categories and across multiple content areas. And yes, Robin, the classroom teachers are going to need extra support um, when they don't have those extra materials. Um, and as we look at some of those examples of scaffolds, materials and resources could be providing um, a complete, a modified or adaptive uh, content for our SLIFE learners. Um, it could be graphic organizers and word banks, but it could be um, helping to adapt the materials in the classroom so that it is more accessible. Um, these are uh, the three categories with some examples of scaffolds in each category. Um, adapting materials is uh, one of the things that you would do um, with some of the scaffolds with materials and resources, um, pre-identifying and pre-teaching vocabulary, um, even figuring out some of that instructional background uh, of what, what they know in their numeracy already before, in the example of the math piece here, uh, before going into learning about uh, percentages and fractions. And then finally, some examples of student groupings. And so we're gonna talk a little bit um, about specific supports or scaffolds for SLIFE uh, that fall into some of those categories. So when we look at some materials and resources, uh, providing students with sorting activities so they can um, categorize concepts um, while they're learning them uh, and be able to uh, use and practice their language as they're uh, sorting through different concepts, vocabulary and descriptions and images. Um, providing students an opportunity to draw a response uh, before writing it. 
in terms of math using instructional uh, scaffolds such as manipulatives. Uh, and here's a great example of looking at uh, fractions. While yes, students are counting, you can develop a basic numeracy of one-to-one -one correlation while still um, identifying and making the connection between uh, one tenth of the fraction and that it's one out of 10 pieces. So you can build both of those skills simultaneously. And then acting out responses. Uh, it Both acting out responses and manipulatives enable uh, a, the instruction to uh, become more concrete, especially the more abstract the concepts are. And in terms of student groupings, home language groupings help students to be able to have conversations and lighten that language load as they are able to have discussions uh, about content within um, their own language. And then providing students uh, with checklists so that as they're completing a word problem or um, another task, they know the steps that they need to do to be able to finish the task. And each ta part of the task is chunked so that they can easily know that after step one, they go on to step two. Sentence uh, stems and paragraph frames are an excellent strategy to move students from uh, that word level to getting them to uh, expand into sentence and discourse level language. Um, in this example, students are learning to compare and contrast. So uh, by providing that paragraph frame, students are more focused on the content while they're being scaffolded that language of com compare and contrast so that at the end, they can develop that paragraph comparing and contrasting the two concepts. Um, as students develop more language, those, those paragraph frames can um, lessen uh, over time or throughout a writing project. And again, early on, some of your SLIFE is their first coming uh, to your classrooms or uh, in content classrooms, they may need heavy uh, paragraph frames and word banks to go with it. But as they learn more language and develop more skills, you can take some of those scaffolds away. Um, another strategy is using wordless picture books. Uh, that way students are very similar to the um, I see, I think I wonder, as students are reading um, wordless picture books, they can use a graphic organizer and have conversations um, and use their home language to talk about what's happening in the text uh, and develop a language without uh, being laden with uh, the, the complexity of the text and the linguist in English. One tool that you can use to plan lessons is our scaffolded lesson planning checklist, which is on our Padlet. Um, I like to use this to plan the lesson, look at the lesson afterwards to double check that I've gone through um, and added all, uh, the appropriate scaffolds. And then after I've taught the lesson, go back and reflect on, uh, did it, did I really meet the needs of my students in terms of the language demands or the, did, did I develop that key vocabulary that was appropriate for the task and for my students? Um, and another tool is that material selection and adaptation checklist. Um, I, and again, going back to that mathematics question, when you're looking at building pre-skills, um, does the material allow itself for skill building or multiple skill building to support students to be exposed to that content, but build the prerequisite skills along with it? Um, this checklist has uh, considerations for material selection and then also uh, several con considerations for adapting um, your materials. So in the chat, if uh, you could share some, uh, a step that you would like to take related to scaffolding instruction for SLAFE in your own context.
All right. Um, and scaffolding is is always uh, a tough, you know, tough to implement, but using a lot of the steps and, and uh, the tools that we have uh, would help with that. All right, we're gonna shift to uh, providing that intense literacy and numeracy instruction. And again, I think this goes a deeper into uh, the question that we had in the chat on, what do we do for those students that need more than just scaffolds? Um, for some of the students, uh, many of our slave, they need intensive literacy and numeracy instruction. And so sometimes we need to provide those intensive skills um, in intervention blocks or additional program models such as after school programming and extended day programming or Saturday schools. However, um, depending on how your the time that you have is set that you have, uh, you can focus on building that in through intervention blocks. One, uh, this slide gives you an example of skills that are focused on in Fairfax County Schools, Virginia, in their secondary literacy course um, for uh, ELLS. The skills that are included are phonemic awareness, phonics, reading fluency, reading comprehension and vocabulary development. Uh, and it's specifically for those students that need that foundational literacy. So uh, for phonics, uh, phonemic awareness skills for SLIFE, um, much like, you know, as they're, for students, uh, Sometimes it's difficult for SLIFE to hear and say sounds in the language they're learning because that sound is not part of the student's home language. Um, if students aren't able to hear those differences in the sounds, it's gonna be difficult for them to read and write them. So uh, providing explicit instruction on those phonemic awareness skills, um, for example, um, just the, getting instruction on the TH sound, that soft TH sound uh, that's in 13th. Um, uh, I was just in a classroom where they were reviewing that because students need to be able to recognize uh, that beginning and ending sound uh, to be able to read and write that word. Um, so supporting students as they recognize and produce rhyming sounds, isolate pron and pronounce beginning, middle and ending sounds, substituting or adding sounds to make new words and counting and pronouncing and blending syllables. Will be skills that are prerequisite to uh, being able to connect to the written word. So some activities could be an odd word out. Like in this example, we have four pictures. You would say the names of the words, uh, students would repeat it, and the students would identify the word, the odd word out. Uh, another activity is what's missing, where students are provided two uh, words and they identify the sound that is missing. For example, they might be given meat and eat, and they'd have to identify that the mm sound is missing. In terms of phonic strategies, as students are hearing and you're practicing that um, oral language uh, associated with uh, sounds, then you would move into creating word family charts or matching books to phonic strategies so that students can start connecting what they're hearing and those sounds that they're hearing to the written word. Using slave creative materials with tar targeted phonics features is extremely helpful and working with students in targeted group work so that they can start building their, um, that connection between that sound and symbol. One example is uh, creating those phonics, the word family chart. Uh, this is a, an example of one with uh, min, around a mini lesson around the ow sound. 
So you would provide students with that spelling, um, go through some words, identifying that sound, and then putting it into context, uh, being able to see it in uh, words that are from a familiar text so that they can um, start making connections to, the, to uh, other words with that same sound pattern. Text comprehension with SLIFE is very important, uh, supporting their comprehension pre-reading, during reading, and post-reading through scaffolded uh, literature circles. Um, you can also provide supporting materials in their home language, modeling uh, those self-monitoring strategies of not only do you read the words on the page, but you think about what you're reading as you read it, um, really supports students to go from that oral culture of uh, learning to a more written culture and the use of explicit instruction. One example uh, that we have on our Padlet is from Inside Out and Back Again, which is written in verse. Um, this is modified for Slife with Low Literacy by providing uh, the content in prose and asking questions of students uh, so that they can understand the basics of the comprehension of the story, along with providing it in their home language. And I'm going to pause for a moment sharing because I want to make sure my audio is on. So we're going to uh, watch a video here. Uh, from a foundation literacy skills class and just watch it and think about what strategies the teacher used in the video that you might want to implement in your context or in your classroom or uh, I know there are some, uh, some participants from migrant education. Um, some of the same strategies, um, I know thinking back to that math example, um, when we're thinking of foundational literacy skills, are there some strategies here that would relate to foundational math skills as well? Can everyone hear this okay? My name is Christopher Maldonado. I'm the ninth and 10th grade literacy teacher at San Francisco International High School. And I teach a literacy class primarily for students with interrupted education. You guys ready? Let's get this going. How are you? Yeah. San Francisco International High School is a high school for recently arrived immigrants in the United States. We have a pretty diverse classroom. There are students from six different countries, three different language groups, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese. So in today's lesson, we'll be focusing on building some fluency practice, phonemic awareness around consonant blends, and also working collaboratively to engage in a reading guide that we've been working on around Frida Kahlo. So when planning this lesson, I think about strategically planning and integrating focused language study to build students' comprehension and word recognition skills together to make them skilled readers. So language comprehension is building like, their schema, their vocabulary, their access to the content, while word recognition is building their phonemic awareness, they're able to word attack and decode, and also recognize sight words that we'll see. Good morning, guys. Good morning. So the first part of class is me just greeting them. So guys, please take out your opening. The students all know when they enter class, they have an objective and an opening to do for each day. Our opening today says, how do you think Frida will feel living in the United States? We are going to think about what is going to happen in the future before we read. If you guys need help, please first ask someone in your group. So up until this day, we've been working around this theme of standing between two places and personal identity. Can you give me a little bit more detail? Like why do, why do you think she misses Mexico? This is their third reading guide on Frida Kahlo and understanding her experience around her home country in Mexico and transitioning to the United States. 
That's very good. And also building this awareness around different mediums to express personal identity. And for Frida, that was art. And guys, we have about two more minutes. Okay, two more minutes. And James, when you're ready, you can go to the computer and start the class. So giving kids options around how they can express their own story, their own identity, coming to the United States. Yeah, definitely. Or you can maybe ask Juan too. Cool, Juan, can you help Anthony with the translation? Thank you so much. Today, um, the student who led the opening was James. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, James. Thank you. So James called on students to read the date, um, to read the objectives, and to read the opening. Juan, can you please read the opening? Uh, do you think Frida will be living in the United States? He was using Class Dojo, so it's a way for students to get points for speaking in English, for helping their group. Can you please read that vocabulary? But also, it's randomly selected, so every student's held accountable to being ready to, to share their opening or share their answer. Number one, repeat after me. I miss. I miss. And how do I say that in Spanish? Uh, very good. How about in Arabic, Omar? How do I say that in Arabic? And Darang, how do you say in Chinese? Very good. So we're going to be working with our groups when we're reading, right? We're going to be talking. We're going to say, can you explain? What did you understand? Yeah. Explain in your language. So good. So I have a teaching assistant in my class. He's a former student I taught three years ago. It's like, it's like this, like a picture. And he advocated to have his 12th grade internship in my class to kind of share his experience about being a newcomer, being a student who wasn't proficient in their native language. And he wanted to come back and kind of share his story and also work with students with similar experiences. So today, we're going to learn more about Frida's identity, who she is in the United States, and we are going to see if our predictions are correct, so-so, or maybe it's different. Okay. And then we started our phonics activity for the day. So these are two letters and two sounds, but we are going to blend them together. Okay. It's a very short, brief period to kind of build some more phonemic awareness skills. Today was around consonant blends, so GL and GR. How about number three? This is a, a word from math class. Graph. And how do you spell graph? G-R-A-P-H. Very good. P-H. And I'm just going to stop that there. Um, and what strategies did the teacher use in that video that you might want to that you might want to implement? Yeah, Class Dojo is uh, an excellent, excellent tool for uh, engaging students and, and almost a digital popsicle stick. Engaging students in that opening routine activity. And you can tell that that was something they've done over and over again. So it wasn't something that was surprising to students. They knew that sharing each native language and engaging them in, in their, their home language. Yeah, one thing that always gets me when I watch this video is how uh, the 12th grade student came back to his classroom uh, to be able to support students because he was once that student. Uh, pulling content words for the phonics lesson. Yes, that one's huge. Um, again, bringing in cross content uh, and cross curricular connections. Um, so when we, again, look at some of that vocabulary development, we want to um, look at, oftentimes we look at math uh, key terms, uh, and we want to make sure that we don't overuse the key terms, but think about like some of those words have multiple meanings or how do we um, pull out some of that uh, vocabulary so that students get a routine or a process with their math learning, um, especially in content areas, uh, but also be flexible with their math thinking uh, so that one, they get the formula of certain word problems without without being stuck with always thinking that's going to be the answer. And some ways to do that is um, maybe providing examples and non-examples for that vocabulary or even those math scenarios. Um, so students are able to um, 
are able to start seeing what is and isn't um, an example in that math world uh, or science or social studies. Um, word walls that are interactive are also very helpful. Um, and students, you can see here with the math word walls, uh, there are real content examples so that students uh, can see uh, what, what not only what the word is, uh, but also can see and interact with it as they're exploring that concept. And I think the biggest uh, piece is as we're teaching across content areas is finding that connection between words that have multiple meanings. In, uh, in fact, I was in a school earlier this week where we were talking about the vocabulary word mean in math class uh, and how it has a very different meaning when we think about, you know, even asking, well, what does that word mean in English? Uh, what it, what it's, or being unkind to someone. Uh, so even volume, uh, as we have media everywhere, we think about how loud something is, as opposed to in math and science, we think about the amount of space inside an object. So um, I think we instead, We'll take a brief poll, but we can just type it in the chat. We're a small group. Um, so which component of infective instruction for SLIFE do you want to focus on uh, more closely? Uh, teaching students about school culture and routines, building conditions for learning, using those oral language activities to scaffold content and written work. Um, or scaffolding academic tasks or providing intense literacy and numeracy. Just type the number into the chat. So we've got a, that intense literacy, a combination of scaffolding and the intense literacy. Um, it's hard to pick just one. Um, so but it seems like a, that intense literacy and numeracy, which we know that it's life when they're when students are coming from various backgrounds, um, they may not they may need some extra intensive literacy and numeracy. So that leads us right into setting our goals. Great. Can I uh, be able yes, to, you can. to advance the screen or the slide? Nice. So we're going to take a look at document six. And that's going to be coming through the chat. There it is. So individually, we might not take the full five minutes because we are running a little bit behind. So just take a couple of minutes and open up document six. You can make a copy. Um, and just type in a goal you have to strengthen instruction of SLIFE in your context. So you click on make a copy, and you click on it in the link. And then we're going to go into final breakout groups. Groups. We're going to condense them a little bit because we have fewer people here. I think maybe just two groups would be great. So we'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll have you share your goal and your first action step. In breakout rooms. So we're not, yeah, let's let's take like yeah, three minutes. Sounds good. Okay. And you don't have to fill in five steps, maybe just think of one or two. <laughs> it is nearly 5 p.m. after all. Oh, our timer stopped again, yeah.
Are we going to go into our breakout rooms after this? We are, yes. Thank you. Are you all set, Susan, or do you need some more time? I, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Maybe we can go ahead and open up the breakout groups. I think we're all back. Would anyone like, anyone like to share one of their goals or plans? I'll, if it's okay, Kathy, I'll share what you said. Just kind of as the last person I heard, or would you like to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, Kathy's um, trained in reading recovery. So she's working, um, implementing some of those strategies for students. I don't know if it was, it's a student that you had that might not necessarily be SLIFE, but missed out on some education um, in virtual learning due to connectivity issues. So that's that's something that Kathy's going to work on. And Susan mentioned working on kind of getting ahead of the teaching, pre-teaching, instead of playing catch up afterwards. So that's that's a goal. Are there any other goals that you share? Shannon, did you hear any good ones? Uh, making that space for the numeracy and liter foundational numeracy and literacy piece. Um, and I think that was one of the biggest conversations I stepped into uh, in joining the breakout group. Uh, so, but I know we're coming to the end and I know we've all had long days, so maybe we can shift to our next steps and uh, the evaluation. So the next steps is implement one or two of those strategies. Think about the, or tools in, in your, uh, in your district or in your context. Um, we, you had some really great action plans. Uh, also attend our upcoming sessions. Uh, the next one in November will be around family and community engagement. And in December, uh, supporting graduation and post-secondary success for SLIFE. And we would really love it if you could reflect on today's session and provide us with some feedback. Um, and I believe uh, Diane Choi just uh, dropped in the link for the, uh, the evaluation. And this has been a jam packed session exploring uh, the framework for effective instruction of SLIFE, discussing strategies for supporting SLIFE engagement uh, with the understanding of content learning, and then said, setting those goals for supporting the academic needs of SLIFE in all classrooms. So we just want to give you a, a really huge uh, thank you. We know we shared a lot of strategies this evening uh, with you, and thank you for hanging in with us this evening. And don't forget to fill out the evaluation. Thanks so much, everyone, and hope to see you next month.